Thanks. You bet. <clears throat> we are three after, and if it's okay, we are going to begin our meeting and at least uh, begin with our preliminaries, and there'll be opportunity for others uh, to join or to identify themselves as they join. I'm Dr. Stephen Holt. I am a principal of Tri Excellence. Erica, you've heard her voice. Uh, we are Tri Excellence, the facilitators for the Executive Steering Committee. And I want to say welcome to today's meeting. Uh, thank you very much for your time and investment. We've got a lot to do. But before we get going, I'd like to just take a moment because there's so much happening in our environment, so much going on in our city. And there's been so much change in our world um, in the last several months. And in all of the spaces that I've been doing this work, one of the things I'm finding is consistent is that we're dealing with a lot of pressure. And sometimes pressure spills over into environments and we uh, have different uh, visceral responses that show up in spaces and in places. What I'd like to do just for a moment is to just pause in reflection of all that's happening, the protests, the unrest, social issues, health and wellness. I want us just to breathe. You just take a moment with me and indulge me, take a nice deep breath and then just let it out. One more nice deep breath and then just let it out. I don't know what's going on in your world and it may not be anything other than the norm or it could be extremely intense. I do wanna say that what's most important is we're doing this work is that we center the value of human beings. What we're trying to do is necessary, it's significant and very important, it's risk. And I thank you for your involvement to stay and to come back to the table for what's in front of us. Uh, I don't want us to miss that which is most common and connecting to us, and that's our humanity. So thank you very much. Susan, if you would lead us in the first few slides. Thank you. You may be on mute. Pardon me, I thought I was on, I thought I was off mute. I'm uh, just gonna do a really quick review so that we all can uh, work together well in the Zoom space, and then just want to provide a little bit of information for the folks who are joining us as attendees. So things that you might be very familiar with for those that are um, on video in the room, the ESC members, as well as the facilitators and, and um, ODOT and others who are supporting them. Uh, if you could please raise your hand to speak, you find that hand raising if you go to the um, panelist, uh, the participant panel that is in the bottom of your screen uh, and click on that, it'll open up the participant panel. And then uh, to the, the bottom left, you'll see a raise hand. So if you do want to speak, if you could click that raise hand feature, uh, it helps Dr. Holt and Erica to see that there is somebody that is waiting in the queue and ready to speak. Um, if for some reason you're not able to activate that, then um, I'll be keeping my eye open as well as I'm sure Dr. Holt and Erica and just raise your hand and maybe wave it a little bit and we'll uh, try to be sure to catch you that way. But if you can do it electronically, that would be very helpful. Um, for the ESC members, uh, if you are okay with keeping your video on, I think that would be terrific. Uh, it just helps everyone to feel like they're a little bit more in person and a little bit more connected. I certainly respect if you feel the need to turn your video off. Um, but we would appreciate it if you if you can. And for those of us that aren't actively uh, participating uh, as staff support, um, we'll have our videos off so that we don't uh, uh, make the room any more congested than need be. Uh, so for today, just for in these instructions and uh, information is really for the folks joining us as public attendees. Um, we're live streaming and recording. Uh, so what you say, folks that are either as attendees and certainly folks in the room will be part of the public record and we just want you to be aware of that. Um, these recordings will be available on the project website tomorrow. Uh, in public attendees, we do have a public comment period that Dr. Holt will be introducing here in a bit. And if you do wish to make a brief um, up to one minute public comment, um, I'll ask you to raise your hand and you do have a uh, a hand indicator on your panel as well. 
And if you could raise your hand and let us know that you wish to speak, we'll get you in the queue and get to as many people as we're able to. If you do have extensive public comments, uh, we welcome you to email those to the address that is on the screen uh, with the subject line uh, that is on the screen, or you can leave us a voicemail. These instructions are also on the very first page of your agenda. And, and really importantly for everyone, if you do have any technical issues, uh, this phone number is a good one to, to jot down. This is uh, Sarah's phone number. Sarah works with me and she is going to be here as technical support. So if you have any issues, if your audio doesn't work or you end up uh, getting kicked out of the Zoom room, please contact Sarah and you can either call her, text her or email her and she'll be happy to give you a hand. Uh, Dr. Holt, I think that is all I needed to say. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Afternoon, everyone again. My name is Erica Warren. I work with Tri Excellence and we are uh, honored and excited to be a part of this work. And today, uh, by way of introductions, um, I'm going to first um, have uh, Chair Simpson introduce himself and give words after that, because this is a public meeting, just to make sure that we have all of our executive steering committee members on record. Uh, once we hear from Chair Simpson, I will just be calling on you at that moment. Please unmute yourself and uh, give us a brief introduction just to check your mic at that time. So uh, as we move forward, um, Chair Alando Simpson, we'd love to hear from you, introduce yourself and any words uh, you'd like to share today. Great, thanks Erica and thanks Susan and Dr. Holt for the intro. Um, again, for the record, uh, Alando Simpson, uh, Vice Chair of the Oregon Transportation Commission and chair of this executive steering committee uh, for the Rose Quarter Improvement Project. And um, uh, really, I guess in a nutshell, um, a couple of comments just wanted to throw out, you know, we're, we're gathering back together. And I think I just got verification that we last met back in June. Clear, clearly a lot of things have happened since June. Um, and um, with all that said, other than just since June, but this entire year to date, um, obviously as human beings, one of the most resilient species on earth, on earth, we're gonna to continue to move forward. And, um, and for, as it relates to this project and everything we've been doing here, we're just you know, looking forward to picking out where we left off at. Um, we're not gonna restart anything. Um, we're just really gonna to continue to move forward, uh, work collaboratively and continue, continue down the path that we originally started earlier this year and things that we've been discussing over the past, you know, year plus as it pertains to this particular project. Um, most of you are probably curious about um, uh, where things stand with uh, two of our partners who were originally at the table. Um, if you were to ask me, I would say that there are still conversations offline that are taking place and um, a lot of positive interactions. Obviously, um, folks and organizations um, choose to take stances and go certain directions and everybody has the freedom to do that, to convey a message or whatever it may be. But at this point, uh, we as a collective here uh, for the ESC members that exist are going to continue to move forward and we have a job to do. And um, hopefully, you know, once those previous partners, which I would still consider them partners, uh, they're just not here at the table right now, um, find it in their best interest to come back and work alongside us, continue to move forward on something that we um, all aspire to be positive and forward facing and, and could be a model of a true multimodal transportation investment project, which could actually be led with equity. Um, we are gonna be here with open arms, um, waiting for them to come back and work alongside us. As, as we've all talked about before, this is much bigger than just a highway project. This is a, this is a community development project. This is an urban planning project. This is a multimodal transportation project. This is a congestion project. There's a, this is a economic development project. And, um, and uh, I, I wanna make sure personally that people realize that it's, there's all these different pieces that tie into this and, it, and it's not just one silo. And so, uh, it's going to be up to us as a group to make sure that we connect all those dots so we can create something that is transformative. Um, lastly, um, you know, this I think is going to be a, an, a model and example of, of really how we do transportation in our region going forward. Um, this is a system issue. 
It is not a one project issue. Uh, we have congestion and choke point issues all over the region and state for that matter. I mean, even along the West Coast, even our entire country lacks the infrastructure that's needed to provide mo mobility for folks um, to get from point A to point B. And so I'm really adamant about us kind of as a group working and thinking bigger and broader about just Rose Quarter, just um, and, and, and start thinking about how it is we actually create something that is a model and a transformative plan and process that not only other places around our region can adopt and learn from, but other metropolitan regions that are dealing with these same challenges, most of them do in our country, um, can, can learn from. And so uh, that's the thing that's really going to, um, you know, motivate me and excite me. And so um, let's, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, put our own personal feelings aside and our personal motivations and make sure that we're working towards an outcome that is gonna be um, filled with shared prosperity and that will be a conduit to help our future generations um, build up off what we can create here. Um, we are just at a point where we definitely need to modernize our regional transportation hurdles, choke points and challenges. And I am gonna be Personally, as a representative of the Transportation Commission, leaning on all of you with all your insight, your intellect, your skill set, your expertise to help us move this thing forward. And um, this is just the this is just the start. And so um, I will turn it back over to uh, to uh, Erica, and I look forward to working alongside all of you. And um, here we go. Thank you, thank you, Chair Simpson, for reminding us that this is uh, bigger than just one thing that we uh, are tasked to do something bigger than ourselves. So quickly, I'm just going to take an opportunity to introduce each of you. If you would, as I call your name, unmute yourself, please just uh, introduce yourself, say here, and we'll move quickly uh, to the next person. Um, I'm going to start from the governor's office, Ms. Leah Horner. Good afternoon, I'm Leah Horner, um, Governor Brown's Jobs and Economy Policy Advisor, as well as Director of Regional, Solu Director of Regional Solutions. Um, and I'm also uh, one of a couple interim transportation policy advisors in the office. Great, thank you, Leah. I'm not sure he's joined us yet, but I'd like to just check Rob Camarillo from Labor. Okay, well, we'll move quickly. Maybe he'll join us shortly uh, from Metro, President Lynn Peterson. I believe President Peterson had joined us by phone. I'll come back to President Peterson. Uh, Dr. Ebony Amato. Here with the North Northeast Community Development Initiative and Program Manager at NAMAC. Thank you for being with us. Mr. Marlon Holmes. I saw him earlier. I wonder if he had some connection issues. I'll come back to him. Um, and I know that Nate is going to be joining us late arriving from a meeting in Albany. So uh, Mr. Brendan Finn from the Urban Mobility Office. Hi there, good, ad good afternoon everyone. Brendan Finn, Director of the Urban Mobility Office. Uh, we're overseeing this uh, ambitious endeavor that uh, Vice Chair Simpson um, alluded to earlier about this comprehensive look at how we address transportation congestion issues uh, with our focus on climate and equity in the Portland metro region, uh, of which this project is a cornerstone, but is also uh, bringing forward some pretty incredible things. I'm excited uh, about today's presentation uh, on the independent cover assessment. Uh, it's uh, kind of urban planning at its best. So uh, I want to thank, on behalf of the agency, thank everyone for their participation, in particular our community members and, of course, uh, our other agency partners. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brendan. Thanks for your leadership on this project. Ms. Jana Jarvis. Yes, Jana Jarvis here from President and CEO of the Oregon Trucking Associations. Thank you. Uh, did I see uh, Ms. Julia Brim Edwards? You did. Julia Brim Edwards with Portland Public Schools and most specifically representing the students, the current and future students of the Harriet Tubman uh, middle school community. Thank you for doing that important work. And Doug Kelsey with TriMet. 
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Like you said, Doug Kelsey. I'm the general manager at TriMet, and I am keenly interested in all things mobility and livability. So what a great place to have this conversation. Indeed, great to have you. Bryson Davis. Yeah, I'm Bryson Davis with the Williams and Russell Project. Um, I'm not used to being last alphabetically. Bryson and Davis being my name, so it's, it's always interesting being last here. But yeah. I'm here. Great, thank you. Just quickly, I'll try to circle back. Marlon, what, did you have the opportunity to join us again? How about President Peterson? Susan will have to unmute the phone line. I was just gonna ask if, if uh, we know what phone number that uh, yeah, President that Peterson president is calling is. on. What's that number? I believe it ends in 324. Okay, great. Let's unmute. Uh, Sarah, can you unmute President Peterson? It's asking me to ask if we can unmute. <laughs> Thank you. We should be good can to go. Hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yay. Hi, everybody. Sorry to join by uh, phone today, but schedules got backed up. So um, obviously, first time using the phone system. Fun. Lynn Peterson, Metro Council President, um, and Metro is proud to be part of this conversation um, as it stands with uh, looking towards the future build out of this part of our region that restores uh, justice to those who were moved out um, by the projects in this area. Thank you so much, President Peterson. Uh, and just so that we can move quickly into the rest of our agenda, um, uh, I believe that Nate McCoy, who is the um, Executive Director of the National Association of Minority Contractors, uh, will also be joining us later today. So I will turn the meeting back over to Dr. Holt. Thanks, Erica. Marlon's uh, having challenges with frozenness, but I appreciate it. Next slide, Susan. We're going to talk about our principles of agreement. I'll be very brief. Next slide. Your voice matters. Uh, I don't think there's any challenge with this group of speaking up and speaking uh, and leaning in to lend your voice. And therefore, we want you to speak your truth. And that just means to be authentic and genuine and present and then listen for understanding. So it's also meaning that as you're speaking and you're also open to hear, uh, I think that our chair made it very clear that uh, there's robust conversation. We anticipate significant interaction, and the goal is the bigger picture than just our own individual issues. So number four means deal with the issues and not with the individuals. Uh, we are, our agreement is we will attack and, and tackle and address the specifics that we need to do so, but we want to make sure we do it in a way that's respectful and understanding, which leads us then into experiencing discomfort. The potential is that as we are being authentic and genuine and listening to one another, it may be uncomfortable, but <clears throat> we uh, expect that as part of the process. So our ask is that you remain respectfully engaged, that if it becomes uncomfortable and it becomes a little tense, that you don't add to that uncomfortability and or tension by making it personal. It's never that. It's always trying to work through the process. And then lastly, expecting and accepting non-closure. We didn't get here overnight. And thinking we can change it overnight is not authentic, but we are committed to the change, which is why we're at the, uh, in this Zoom together. So thanks, Susan. Today, next slide. <clears throat> well, I will go to our public comment. Susan, back to you. Sure. Uh, so if we do have any members of the public who would like to make comment, this would be the time for you to raise your hand. So I am looking over at the attendees list to see if we have any hands raised. Um, if there are any of you that wish to make public comment, please raise your hand. And otherwise, if I do not see any here in a moment, I will hand it back to Dr. Holt. So just pausing. Does anyone wish to make public comment? Not seeing any hands, Dr. Holt. Thank you very much, Susan. Mm -hmm. We are going to go to our uh, director's update and uh, uh, program um, director, manager is 
Megan. Hey everyone, um, thanks for being here this afternoon. Uh, I'm Megan Channel, I am the project director with ODOT for the I-5 Rose Quarter Improvement Project and happy to be here with you today. Um, go to the next slide, Susan. Uh, so before I get into any specifics uh, on, on where we are, I think it's important to make sure that we're acknowledging the history of this area, particularly with restorative justice really at our, our foundational core as we move forward. So I want to acknowledge uh, on behalf of ODOT the harms uh, of people to color, especially to the black community in Albina, past and present uh, from ODOT's construction of the interstate highway system. We know that the original construction of I-5 through Albina was central to the unjust history, uh, the disconnection, the displacement of, of Portland's Black community. And so as we partner together uh, to design and, and build this project with the community, we have to work to address these past harms uh, and repair the damage that was done. And with this project, I think as you, you've heard uh, our chair uh, today so eloquently say, you know, we're committed to doing this differently. We're committed to doing this by centering the voices of the black community, working collaboratively uh, and openly to uh, ensure that we're creating a reconnected and rejuvenated uh, historic Albina. And we're committed to promoting communities where black Portlanders and communities of color can thrive, um, both in the uh, short-term job opportunity creation that we have and the long-term outcomes that this project creates. And this executive steering committee, along with ODOT, um, I know that you've worked really hard to develop a set of values that will guide this project, uh, again, with restorative justice at, at its core. Um, and as we know, uh, you know, restorative justice really demands that the people that were harmed uh, by an action are the people who participate in the correction of that action and have the influence of those decisions and the outcomes and the benefits that we will see. So we're taking this action very seriously. We're taking this action, um, including with the formation um, of the historic Albina Advisory Board that I'll touch on um, in just a moment here um, and do this as we move forward. Um, and so I just, I really look forward to uh, continuing our partnership together so that we can get this project right. So as we move forward, uh, I do want to hit on the project schedule. Um, I know that uh, the project schedule, particularly uh, kind of the timeline of key milestones, timelines, and the sequencing of the different efforts are really important uh, to you as a steering committee and, and to our community partners. So today I just wanted to uh, bring this programmatic schedule in front of you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna focus on a few of the key milestones and I'm obviously happy to make myself available for subsequent questions and conversations on this as well. Um, but again, wanna focus and emphasize that we're really early in this process. Uh, we still uh, have not made any uh, key design decisions. Um, we have the design concept, the framework at about a 15% design and um, we're not yet at a point where we've made those design decisions. Uh, and so uh, in, in terms of the timeline, um, we'll start to move from what I call assumption land where we are today into decision making uh, really in fall of 2021 is when we start that process. So in the meantime, there's a lot of important work uh, to help us get there. Uh, first and foremost, there's the community input and process um, that you see with the different committees at the bottom of your screen, um, in particular with this, this committee uh, and you, uh, and thank you for your, your um, you know, support and time that you're spending here as a steering committee member, uh, as well as with the new historic Albina advisory board that we will be standing up um, and our community oversight advisory committee uh, and then broader community engagement throughout. We're also actively uh, working with our federal partners at the Federal Highway Administration to complete the environmental review process that started back uh, in 2017, uh, and that's expected to be completed um, within about a month's time. And uh, as you know, uh, and many of you have requested, and as we've been directed by the Oregon Transportation Commission, we've also engaged uh, the independent uh, highway cover assessment team uh, to conduct an independent third party review of the highway cover design. Uh, and so this work will extend into spring of 2021. Uh, and just wanna, again, highlight that that work is strategically being done before we get into the decision-making component of the project design timeline, which again is 30% starting in fall of 21. 
Um, and so this work will help us uh, be able to advance um, that that 30% design milestone, the project decisions. Um, and you'll be hearing more from uh, this independent assessment group uh, later on in your agenda. Um, last but not least, you know, we're still expecting uh, construction to begin in 2023. Uh, and this construction schedule will of course be uh, developed in consultation with our um, CMGC contractor or construction management general, uh, general contractor. Um, and as I said, again, we'll be working very broadly with the community uh, throughout this process. So next slide. Speaking of CMGC, uh, I think uh, you've probably uh, seen the notifications around this, but since it's uh, um, been a few months since our last meeting, just wanted to provide you with an update um, about the intent to award our CMGC contract to the Hamilton Sunt Joint Venture Team. And they are working in association with Raymore Construction. Um, and uh, this is really, it's an exciting step uh, to bring another important partner uh, to our project team to help us design and build a project uh, that again is, is founded on community input and values. And uh, the CMGC process also marks a significant milestone for ODOT and uh, that we're taking this action to do business differently uh, for the first time in the Portland metro region, you know, we're, we're using the CMGC model. We're bringing the contractor on early in the design phase uh, and the contractor specifications that they're required to, um, to carry forward uh, also were developed in direct consultation uh, and with and through, with input uh, from the community. So um, an, exciting, an exciting process to kick us off and an exciting partnership to carry forward. Uh, and so the CMGC will really help us uh, with our community partnerships, uh, specifically helping us increase economic opportunities through the DBE and workforce program. Uh, the DBE goal for this project is one of the highest that we've seen at ODOT at 18 to 22% uh, utilization goal. And uh, it'll also help us uh, in bringing the CMGC on early in our design process, just help us optimize uh, innovation early in the design process and uh, help us manage and reduce our risk as we move forward. So last but not least on the next slide, I uh, just wanted to provide uh, an update on the project committees um, who we will make sure moving forward uh, that we have um, direct communication uh, with, uh, with kind of the conversations that are happening both at the Community Oversight Advisory Committee uh, and the new Historic Albina Advisory Board. Uh, so I wanna just draw attention to the Community Oversight Advisory Committee uh, and just let you know that we've made a shift in the role of that committee uh, through you know, coordination with our members. Uh, they were pivotal in helping us develop the CMGC specifications. So again, the, really the, the rules and requirements of our contractor moving forward. Um, helping us inform uh, and, and, and push forward that strong and robust DBE goal moving forward. Um, with those specifications set, they're now gonna shift to being an oversight and accountability body. Um, so that community voice that's working directly with us at ODOT, directly with the CMGC um, to, to make clear community expectations um, and work together with us in partnership uh, and how we meet and exceed uh, the goals for the project. Uh, and then we also uh, did make a change with our community advisory committee. Uh, we uh, have sunsetted the community advisory committee uh, to instate a new board uh, that again is centering our values on restorative justice, centering the voices of the black community um, to create a historic Albina advisory board. They'll continue to serve uh, the same sort of mission and role as uh, was envisioned for the community advisory committee. But that new membership to make sure that again, as we're moving towards a project that is going to benefit those who are historically harmed, that 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 the that the historic Albina community is centered uh, in those uh, design decisions, and I think that's a um, uh, for the historic Albina advisory board. That's also going to be the first place where a lot of the design discussions are coming, um, so that as they get to you as a steering committee to provide that direction. Uh, moving forward, it will have um, gone through our historic Albina Advisory Board and you'll be hearing it um, with their recommendations uh, included. So with that, um, that concludes my project uh, director's update today and I'm happy to answer questions now uh, or Dr. Holt, I'll defer to you in the interest of time if, if we should collect them and I answer them later. Thanks, Megan, I appreciate it. 
Uh, if there's any pressing question, you can indicate so by the raise the hand function. Otherwise, we will definitely circle back. Excellent. Well, we will keep going. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our charter and governance. We've spent quite a bit of time in one-on-ones, and thank you very much for being willing to talk through charter and values with me. Uh, also, the discussion has been taken further to the PMG uh, level of conversation, which includes ODOT, Metro, PPS, and TriMet uh, to support this conversation so that partners have the opportunity to really weigh in, think through uh, charter issues, governance issues, and the values that we're going to make decisions around tonight. It really shouldn't take us too much time. Um, because we've done much of this work to come into this space. So the thing I'm going to ask, if you could go to the next slide, Susan, is here are the components of the charter as they stand. It gives the overview of what the charter is and what, it, what the expectations are, the charge, the membership, decision-making, roles and responsibilities, operational agreements, and of course, uh, expanded around in the charter itself. But here are the six elements of the charter. Uh, I would ask if each of you are prepared as a member of the ESC uh, to make a, a decision to say we accept and agree with the charter as it stands and we want to move it into action. Um, if you have a question or concern, then I will have you uh, identify that as we go around. And so my simple answer, or my simple request would be is if you are in agreement, with the six components as identified and are ready to move forward with standing the charter up or putting it into place, you will simply say yes or no or ask your question as I call upon you. All right. And I'm going to go to Chair Simpson. Uh, yes, Dr. Holm. Thank you very much. Dr. Amato? Yes. Thank you. Marlon Holmes? Yes. Thank you, and good to see you, Marla. Leah Horner. Yes. Thank you very much. And Jenna Jarvis. Yes. Thank you very much. Doug Kelsey. Yes, from TriMet. Thank you. Bryson Davis. Yes. Thank you very much. Julia Brim Edwards. So I have a question just on the charge because I'm yes. not finding it. And I guess, um, and this is one of the issues, Dr. Holt, that uh, you and I discussed of like the fact that the charter and the values are sort of complementary documents and in and of themselves don't necessarily, um, aren't freestanding. And so in the charter, one of the, the section relating to the, the charge I'm still looking through here to any acknowledgement about, there's a discussion about um, in, the, in the values about past harms, but there's not a explicit um, call out of the I-5 um, impact, the, early, the earlier impact on students in the Harriet Tubman school community. And I don't know if that's, again, if you, you can not have it in the, in the charge and it's something in, in explicitly called out in the values, but since we had the discussion about them being interlocked, um, I'm hesitant to say I'm okay with the charter. And then if it's not linked to the charge and the charge doesn't have some sort of explicit call out about um, that aspect of it. I appreciate that. Thank you for raising that. We did have extensive conversation in regard to that. So thank you for raising it. I mentioned that we could uh, interact with that tonight. My suggestion would be that we, um, uh, once we talk through the values as well, provided there is still concern, that's something we can then uh, spend some time and make sure it is spelled out uh, in a way that, that is agreeable uh, among the group. Is that, is that workable for you? That does. I'll just put a, uh, a, a hold for a moment. And when the whole conversation comes together. Excellent. Can, well, thank you very much. Um, Brendan, was there anything that you were going to say? That means. 
No, sir. Thank you. Okay. I thought you were raising your hand. Well, for okay, we will then move to our values document. Again, um, Dr. So, Holt, Dr. Holt, this is Lynn. Yeah, oh, there, there's sorry. a couple others, doctor. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, Lynn. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, thank you. I have three, I guess the general uh, answer to your question is yes, but I have three questions I'd like to raise and put on the table, um, whether they belong in the document or if we can further refine afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is how does the, C the ESC communicate recommendations and how are those considered by the OTC? The second one is how does the ESC receive recommendations from the HAAB and the COAC? Will liaisons provide regular reports or, you know, how will that happen? Um, and then my third one relates to um, the, the update that we're getting today. And that is, um, will we get the independent cover assessment before the 30% design? so that it, we can reflect it back to the values or how to, these are all process questions kind of, right? But I'm, I'm not sure how all of these things are gonna flow in and out of our committee. Excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if we could come back to the questions after we make a determination or at least feedback around the values and we'll come back to those questions if you're okay with that, President Peterson. Are you still there? Did we lose her? I do not see her uh, on the line any further, Dr. Holt. Oh, I did right. capture her questions, and, and I'm sure Sarah did as well, but I, it looks like she dropped off. Okay. Well, let's have our values uh, response, and then we'll come back to her questions, if that's okay. Yes. Dr. Holt. Did, 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 yes, I did. Just for the record, uh, I'll get I'll be affirmative on the the charter components on behalf of the agency. Okay, thank you. Yes, Chair Simpson. Well, we had did Nate McCoy ever come back on the line, or is he is he still not here? He is not. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay. Yeah. Everyone else was accounted for, other than President Peterson. So let's proceed to our next uh, aspect, our values document. Next slide, please, Susan. Here are the components of the values document. The commitments, restorative justice, community input and transparent decision-making, mobility focused, climate action and improvement around public health. And each of those are again expanded on in the document and we've spent time talking through them with each of the executive steering committees and then their, uh, as you heard, the PMG representatives have also further communicated, spent time to uh, support the documents as, um, uh, as um, drafted. My request again, my question again to uh, the committee, is if you are in agreement with the values as identified, you can identify that or make it known by saying yes. If you have a question or a concern or are not in agreement, I'll just call your name and uh, we'll go through it the same way we did. I'll begin with you, Chair Simpson. Um, quickly, I'd prefer to go at the end just in case other people have a lot of extensive conversation related, related to these matters. But for the most part, um, it looks pretty pretty good to me. Um, there was another thing, and I'll have to come back to you about it. But so far, okay. we're good. Okay. All right. We will certainly circle back. Doug Kelsey. I am supportive um, with an asterisk, um, mm -hmm. not knowing where it fits in the overall program, and that's that we must live within our fiscal realities. Thank you very much. Dr. Amato. 
I'm supportive. I believe the values embody everything um, that we're, you know, trying to obtain. I do like the financial aspect of it, but I am okay with where they are right now. Thank you very much, Bryson Davis. Uh, I'm supportive. I think it's. I think it uh, reflects what we what we need. Thank you, Shanna Jarvis. I'm supportive. I do like the comments about the uh, fiscal responsibility that we need to focus on too. Thank you, Leah Horner. Um, thank you. Yes, I am supportive of these values as defined right here. Thank you, Marlon Holmes. Yes. Thank you very much. And Julia Brim Edwards. Yeah, two things um, on the community input. Um, mm -hmm. my, prefer my preference would be community informed. And then I was trying to find a, the place, the right place to um, insert the uh, very specific um, issue related to Harriet Tubman students. And it seems like um, the values, climate action and improved public health. Uh, the last point somewhat gets to it, but I think it um, improve is not probably the standard, improve from where it is is probably not the standard that we would want. And so I have, I have a uh, proposed uh, bullet point to add if, if I may propose it for consideration. Absolutely. And this is a concept, conceptual sentence, um, again, trying to capture a little bit finer point of that third point, um, that it would be something to the extent of air quality on the grounds of Harriet Tubman Middle School and the adjacent Lillis Albina Park is at a level that medical and public health professionals say is safe for children and youth. Thank you. And that could be added into, I think, uh, would you say under improved health quality and public health? That could fit it, in there. It, it could either make that third bullet point longer or just a separate bullet point. But the third bullet point doesn't quite gather it because you could improve the air quality and it would still not be um, safe for youth and children who are either playing in that uh, Portland Park or on the outside grounds of Harriet Tubman Middle School. Thank you very much for that capture. Brendan, uh, well, prior to that, I, uh, President Peterson is back uh, on the line and we wanted to hear you uh, around the values. I am support, thanks. Thank you very much. Brendan, uh, regarding charter and values. Yeah, supportive of the values uh, <clears throat> on behalf of the agency. Also want to acknowledge all the hard work that's gone into this, uh, and in particular, um, as, as uh, Chair Simpson alluded to, the, the contributions we got to these values from, uh, from partners that, that were uh, previously at the table. Uh, we wanna, I want to acknowledge that uh, the work and, uh, um, that they put in on, on these values as well, and that uh, um, that didn't go without uh, without us taking notice and taking action. Thank you very much. I don't know if Chair Simpson or Brendan, if you wanted to respond at this moment to uh, President Peterson and her initial questions. And Susan, I could have you read um, the questions. Sure. Um, happy to do so. So the first, uh, the first question was, um, how does, <clears throat> excuse me, how does the executive steering committee uh, communicate the recommendations to the um, Oregon Transportation Commission? Okay. I do want to have Megan on too, to chill. Maybe I'll, I'll let you have the first crack at that, Megan, and then uh, the vice chair and myself can um, also join in. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think with with uh, our ESC Chair Simpson and OTC Vice Chair Simpson, uh, he definitely will be um, helping us serve um, as uh, as uh, the connection between ESC and the OTC. 
Um, but the the OTC uh, will be as they're um, making any decisions or taking direction um, or giving direction on the project uh, will be done based on the uh, feedback uh, input recommendations from this group. Um, and so the conversations again, as I mentioned earlier, starting with the historic Albina Advisory Board uh, as their you know design related uh, decisions as an example. Uh, we'll go to that board first. Uh, we'll then come to you as an ESC to provide um, the, uh, the recommendations and then communicate it up to the uh, Oregon Transportation Commission. Um, I'm sure I myself as the project director uh, will likely uh, continue to give regular updates to the OTC um, and carrying that forward. Um, so that's, that's, that is the, that's how we'd be communicating the recommendations forward. But I guess I would just like to flag, this is Lynn. Um, thank you, Megan. I appreciate all those communication structures, um, but not having a, a, a rotating or a secondary person to our esteemed chair on this committee, uh, who is also on the OTC, I think is a disservice um, to the OTC to not hear directly from the members of what's going on. So I, I would encourage you to think a little bit broader about the um, options for ESC members to participate with OTC in those updates. Great, I, thanks for the comment, President Peterson. We could definitely think about that yep. and uh, happy to partner with you and, um, and your staff and, and how we uh, can yep. better frame up that communication. Thanks, and I, I, I just, you know, I. I truly believe that every time we have this opportunity, we need to acknowledge that there are folks who may never have presented to the OTC, don't know them. This is an opportunity to allow um, for more communication uh, between more people um, and, and allow that kind of uh, experience to happen. It's an important experience to be able to actually communicate with your statewide, not elected officials, but statewide appointed officials. I actually really like that idea. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> uh, just having other members, hopefully if their schedules permit, um, obviously Zoom makes it a little bit more accommodating, um, but because I know it, you know, um, when you're sitting up there, um, it, it can be a little, um, intimidating when you, when you first start out in some of these testimony um, formats. But um, I definitely agree with that approach. And I think maybe if we do do that, it should obviously be rotating. I'm not saying that everybody has to do it, but I would highly recommend that folks um, engage themselves in participating in that process and voicing your own personal sentiments of the rest of my colleagues on the OTC. That would be welcomed uh, by me a lot personally. So thank you, President Peterson, for that suggestion. Let's thank go to you. question number two, Susan. Um, the question I noted is, uh, how does the ESC receive recommendations from the historic Albina Advisory Board and from the COAC? Again, I'm gonna ask yeah. Megan to, to address that first. <laughs> Sure. Um, so the we uh, the plan was to have the facilitators of the historic Albina Advisory Board, uh, as well as the COAC, the Community Oversight um, uh, Advisory Committee, uh, join us in uh, future ESC meetings to provide uh, those updates uh, from the group to make sure that you are are hearing that communication um, and really the um, the community input as you again are are making your decisions and recommendations. So I guess I would just second my last comment. And um, again, um, unfiltering information and having uh, representatives be able to come and directly address the ESC would be helpful besides the facilitators, which can give um, a good up uh, 60,000 foot level summary of what happened, but it would be nice to hear from the, the community members themselves. Great. Yeah, it's a good, another good suggestion, President Peterson. And then question number three, Susan. Unless, um, I'm sorry, unless, <laughs> unless Brendan or Chair Simpson wanted to weigh in there. 
Yep. Okay. Question number three, Susan. All right, um, and I understood this, uh, President Peterson, to be a, an update question, and that is, um, as far as the cover, the independent cover assessment process, um, will the ESC have an opportunity to weigh in on that before 30% design? Yes, and the answer is yes. That work uh, is happening now and looking forward to the presentation from the team today to kick it off. Um, but that'll be completed, President Peterson, in spring of 21, whereas 30% design is fall of 21. So there is, um, the, there is that time in the schedule to complete the highway cover um, assessment prior to 30%. Thank you. Much appreciated, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Um, can I can I plug in real quick? We're at four o'clock. We're scheduled for four thirty. Just an FYI, um, and I don't know if others have the same circumstances, but I have a I have a five o'clock pickup for childcare. Just an FYI. Thank you, Jerry. Up, but yeah, I, I, I it's it's Doug from Prime. I have a four thirty four thirty one commitment, so I'm kind of hardwired to four thirty. So, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, well, thanks for the discussion around um, the charter and values. And as we always know, that uh, the best laid plans, you can anticipate something will be brief and then it is not. So uh, in light of that, uh, two things. One is based in the feedback that was given around the charter with the additional um, comments, we have uh, supported it and moved it forward. And then also with the values, uh, with the additional comments, uh, supported it and moved it forward. If there are further conversations and or questions, we certainly will entertain that and circle back around for uh, a discussion. Yes, Doug. Yeah, I just question, is, is there another round of these coming back? I just want to, I heard some questions and some responses. I know, I just want to make sure I, ha I have clarity on next steps here, what we in fact did agree to. Um, you will be getting all of the updated commentary and get a chance to look it over. Hopefully, you and I can actually secure a one-on-one -on -one so we can talk through some things prior to the meeting. It would be amazing to be able to do that. So then we can make sure that when we gather, uh, we're prepared. So uh, we will be circling around with the information that was added and making sure that uh, all things are clear for everybody. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Dr. Holt, just briefly, I wanted to make you aware that Nate McCoy has also joined our call. I see. i looking at his wonderful face. Hi, Nate. How are you? Good to see you. And Dr. Holt also just wanted to note that I did capture uh, Julia Brim Edwards' bullet, but I, I might be missing a couple words, so it would be helpful uh, offline or whatever would be appropriate. Just we'll to circle back. back offline. We okay. had a 55-minute presentation prepared and, uh, or I should say, uh, presentations uh, planned for the uh, independent highway uh, um, uh, covers. And I'm going to now defer to Sam. And Sam, uh, obviously, we're pressed on time. My apologies in that regard. The conversation was necessary to that, but we put it in your hands, sir. Uh, thank you very much, and good afternoon. My name is Sam Imperati. I'm a local facilitator. And this afternoon, my capacity is that of the independent cover process assessment facilitator. Uh, we're with you uh, today uh, to provide a presentation that's designed to give you a preliminary overview of the cover evaluation and input process we are uh, suggesting for moving forward. We want to start uh, from the get-go with clarity that you, the ESC, are our client, not ODOT. You drive this process. And the next slide shows us our agenda uh, for uh, today, in which I'll just quickly walk us through. So um, we have with us the, uh, the prime contractor, ZGF architectural firm. And uh, Nolan Leinhart will describe our team that makes up um, extensive uh, numbers of, of consultants. Uh, he will describe our scope, our general process. I'll talk a little bit about the importance of our independence and to that which is in our contract and that which we are committed to as professionals. One of our colleagues, Stephen Lewis from ZGF, will talk about the values and outcomes 
uh, based upon your decisions today. And finally, there'll be an opportunity for in-depth um, discussions moving forward. We'll be back with you on several occasions asking for your specific guidance and input on our substantive work. Um, at the end of our presentation, we'll be asking you if you have any suggestions for moving forward at this general process level. However, during, during Nolan, Stevens, or my presentations, feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you if you have questions for clarification on the way along the way. And with that, I thank you and I'll turn it over uh, to my partner, Nolan. Nolan, take it away. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so with apologies in advance, if we move quickly, uh, we do wanna make sure that we leave enough time um, for all of you to um, chime in if you have questions. Um, so I'll introduce from the start, um, Sam mentioned um, ZGF is the prime consultant on this contract. Um, and uh, we have a core team of subconsultants um, including uh, Arup, focusing on uh, technical analysis and assessment, uh, HRNA, focusing on real estate um, and financial elements of, of our effort, and then ICM, uh, Sam and Parati, our facilitator. Uh, we've broken up our projects into design, engagement, governance, technical, and then of course, um, the core assessment. And so uh, those core team firms each uh, will take responsibility. Uh, we also have <clears throat> Melk Landscape Architects supporting uh, the design team as well as Swen Ho Design. On engagement, we have Swen Ho Design and Christine Rains uh, supporting the engagement side. And then um, Leland Consulting Group supporting HRNA and the governance uh, tasks. And then KPFF uh, and Tool Design Group uh, supporting Arup on the technical analysis. And then Olmsted and Terry Hayes Associates uh, supporting Arup and ZGF on the assessment tasks. Want to touch um, very briefly on our scope, uh, what it is, why we're doing it. Um, the we have you'll this will look familiar. It comes directly from your values and outcomes. Uh, why we are here, and it's um, as Sam said, um, you know the ESC is our client on this. Uh, we are intending to be responsive to uh, the ESC and the work that you uh, have done and the work that the organizations you represent have done. And so rather than recite this, I know you've all spent some time with it. Uh, we just wanted to reiterate that, that our why is the same as your why in terms of why we're here. Um, getting more specific to our independent assessment, there are three questions that the OTC has asked us to study. Um, the first is how can this project serve community aspirations on the highway covers and areas immediately adjacent to the highway covers within the area of potential impact as defined in the EA? The second question is what modifications to the current design and configuration of the highway covers would be needed to reflect a broader community vision for the development of the project area? And then third, are there architectural and engineering considerations to feasibly promote economic development and growth potential consistent with the community's vision? So those are the three uh, questions that really form and shape our work. Um, and as part of that, um, the uh, OTC uh, RFP that we responded to established a number of scenarios that they would like us to study. Um, the first, which we would call the base case is the um, uh, concept put forth in the NEPA environmental assessment. Uh, we will then develop two additional scenarios, one of which would be limited to the area of potential impact as described in the NEPA environmental assessment. And then a second that may extend beyond that. And so it's sort of one's in and one may extend beyond. Uh, once you've seen those, um, the ESC has an opportunity to direct us to create a third scenario uh, with cr criteria to be established by, by you really. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in this meeting and others. So um, walking again quickly through our process, um, we've talked a little bit about um, the relationships between different groups, but this is a diagram just showing for our assessment, uh, our reporting structure. Um, we have uh, the agency project director will uh, assist with contract management uh, through OTC for our work. Uh, we also have a committee called the uh, Highway Covers Coordinated Committee, uh, which consists of staff uh, from ODOT and Metro and Portland Public Schools uh, to help guide on a, a fine-grained basis um, our schedule and, and uh, our different aspects of our project. Um, 
you can see that center straight line, the ESC um, is providing um, direction to us. And that, that should be very clear. Uh, we will also be um, uh, keeping the HAAB, Historic Al Albina Advisory Board, uh, informed, and we will be soliciting advice from them. Uh, their input will be critical um, as voices of the historic uh, Black community in this area. And then we will be having community uh, workshops and um, meetings with stakeholders potentially as well um, to get targeted uh, feedback and make sure that we're hitting the people that we need to uh, hear from. Um, we also, just because we know that the ESC is um, uh, engaged in the full range of um, uh, the project and our effort is not, we just wanted to show how our effort relates uh, to the broader uh, project um, uh, structure. So, um, I won't spend too much time on this, uh, given uh, that we're a little bit short on time, uh, but I mentioned the ESC is directing our work, uh, and, and this is also in, in your charter, this information on this slide, so I'll, I'll move past it quickly. Um, the Highway Cover Coordinating Committee, uh, as I described on the last slide, um, is really helping to um, be responsive to us, really support our work, um, provide information as we need it uh, so that we can make informed um, uh, recommendations and, and study. Um, but ultimately, they are supporting our work and uh, ESC is directing it. The Historic Albina Advisory Board uh, will be very valuable advisors bringing the voice of the community to us and particularly the voice of the African-American community. Um, I, I should have mentioned we have this icon um, down here, if you can see my mouse, uh, where it says work sessions. Um, our project is gonna be shaped around work sessions, which we'll describe, but just in case you were wondering what this is, it's describing the components of a work session, uh, which is one ESC meeting, one HAAB meeting and two community workshops. Uh, and the community workshops. So these are intended to be um, uh, like an open house, like a project open house, where there's an opportunity both for community members to understand uh, the work that we've been asked to do, to share with us their perspectives about what com community priorities are uh, and what uh, positive outcomes are that might um, come out of the, this process. Um, they will be online in this case, uh, and we're going to uh, use a number of methods so that we can still have collaborative and engaging meetings with people uh, where we are not just speaking to them, but we are offering opportunities for them to speak, opportunities for them to make observations about this area and its potential and its shortcomings and its needs. Uh, we will summarize these uh, community workshops and present that to the HAA be so that they have that information as they consider our work and give us feedback. And then we will wrap up the community workshops feedback and the uh, Historic Albina Advisory Board uh, feedback and present that to the ESC so that you have that uh, knowledge when you're making your recommendations to us. Uh, and then finally, I mentioned that um, there are potentially stakeholder group meetings, uh, and these are a contingency task in our contract, but we recognize that not everyone may be able to make community workshops, uh, either due to the time of day or the format or their feeling uh, about, you know, how, how well they're able to engage in a workshop setting. Um, there may also be groups that have um, particular um, knowledge or experience that we want to do a deep dive with them. And so we have the opportunity, um, if we all agree that it's something that's important, um, to identify a number of groups that we would do direct outreach to, be that focus groups uh, or special meetings, um, to gather their, their thoughts and, and feedback. So this is our process and milestone, and I, and I apologize that there is a lot of, of content, but um, we were told that um, this group would have great interest in how events are sequenced and the relationship. Um, so I, I've got a couple slides following this to describe the work sessions, but um, suffice it to say we are here at the big red dot uh, here. Um, having our ESC introduction to you, uh, we will have three work sessions, the first of which will really be focused on um, a demonstrating and sharing our understanding of the project area, uh, the, pro the NEPA EA project as it stands, and um, uh, based on the work that ESC has done and its different partner organizations have done uh, presenting a draft of an evaluation framework for how we can evaluate both uh, the environmental assessment and the scenarios that we would then create. Uh, we would have an opportunity to get feedback about those things uh, and then refine that evaluation framework before starting to develop uh, scenarios. 
we would develop two scenarios that we would bring into work session two. Again, one that is within the footprint of the area of potential impact and then one which may expand beyond it. Uh, we would get feedback about that. Uh, we would understand how well those are serving community needs and interests uh, from the community workshops, from the HAAB, and then from the ESC. And then we would get advice on how to improve those. Uh, we would also hear from the ESC at that time whether we need to create a third scenario. Uh, and, and you would give us direction at that time. Um, and again, um, hopefully there'll be more time to dive into this, but in between those work sessions, um, we've described what we will be doing, um, which I've described in an outline. At the end of the process, uh, the ESC would make a recommendation to the Oregon Transportation Commission, which would then uh, decide how to direct the Rose Quarter um, improvement uh, project team. Uh, so here are the questions that we anticipate uh, asking at the different work sessions. Uh, the first is focused around listening and assessing, um, verifying community values and desired outcomes, uh, understanding what constraints and opportunities might guide the creation of our scenarios, and then really uh, verifying what metrics should be used to measure success. Work session two uh, is themed ideate, generate, and that really is where we start to throw out some ideas. And we may hear that some of them are great and people love them. We may hear that some of them aren't as great and people hate them, but it will help us to refine and improve uh, the scenarios that we present uh, and to help the ESC shape a recommendation on a potential third scenario. Work session three uh, will be sort of the final evaluation, uh, but also an opportunity for refinement, both of the physical concepts, uh, but also issues uh, around uh, financial uh, and operational partnerships or tools that would be needed to finance and implement any desired improvements that we have drawn. Um, and then finally, again, uh, understand how well does each of these scenarios uh, serve the community vision and outcomes. So um, Sam's gonna now talk briefly about what do we mean by independent when we say independent cover assessment? Uh, thank you, Nolan. So in a nutshell, um, both professionally and contractually, we are obligated to ensure that we are not to be influenced by ODOT and outside sources. Our responsibility is to listen to you the members of the ESC, as you direct us to uh, commu uh, communicate with the HAB, communicate with the other voices and stakeholders in the community, we will do so and, and bring that ba information back up uh, to you. Our contract specifically says that we are to make all reasonable efforts to maintain our professional independence. and. Uh, and that we, at, from a substantive analytical perspective, when making our recommendations, we are responsible uh, for that, those analyses. So next slide, please. And um, I have a rather unique role um, in this process, and it was uh, quite intentionally negotiated. I'm sort of like, uh, the inspector general, if you will, using the federal model where I have a specifically called out task to monitor our independence and ensure that our review process and reports are in fact consistent with the facilitation needs assessment report, which you will be seeing at, their, at your next meeting. And I plan uh, to be open and transparent about that. Take it away, Nolan, for the next yeah, so um, next I want to introduce my colleague Stephen Lewis, um, who is going to talk about how we intend to use um, uh, the values and outcomes that you all have created as the foundation of our work. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to uh, listen in and see how everybody's uh, commitment to this is shared and while there are individual interests represented uh, the collective um, sort of movement seems to be toward something bigger than, than everybody as individuals. So I very much appreciate that. Uh, the four pillars of our evaluation really come from the ESC in terms of vision, values and outcomes that have been documented. And along with those, uh, a series of kind of performance um, uh, bullets 
were associated with that. And those become uh, the basic criteria as stated by the ESC, the lenses through which the environmental assessment alternative will be reviewed and evaluated as well as all, uh, additional alternatives. Um, the integrity of our process really relies on the transparency and use of data to drive the information and the decisions. And, and to that extent, there's been a plethora of, of communiques, uh, memos, uh, other plans uh, that we've been scanning and scouring and pulling out the critical uh, requests, demands, what have you, that fall under those basic values and outcomes as stated by the ESC. And we're organizing them, uh, and this is an evolving kind of methodology that uh, we're trying to build in specific regard to the uniqueness of this project. And I wish it really was unique, but we can look at so many cities around the country that have had erasure of black communities at the hands of the Federal Highways Act and so forth, but that's a whole nother lecture. Um, in this case, each of our consultant team members has a lens through which they're looking at the project. Um, Terry Hayes and Associates and Olmstead are looking at social cohesion. Uh, we're looking at the urban design. There's um, uh, two other, you know, appropriate lenses, and each of those consultants will populate our tool with items that we have discovered through our professional practice on this that may not have been uh, generated in, uh, by either you or the other communications that we've been mining in. So together, we'll have a very holistic picture of the uh, needs for and the, and the enhanced values and outcomes for the project and allow this tool to help guide ultimately the decision making. So we look forward to the opportunity to, to present that to you all at a future meeting and get your input and that will help refine that tool and then you'll be very familiar with it as the process continues toward that ultimate uh, recommendation. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, next up is our discussion. And before um, I call on you, I'll uh, simply indicate if you haven't heard already, we will be contacting each of you individually to have a one-on-one -on -one to sit down in depth in detail. Uh, so you can give us our, your specific feedback, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, on, the, on the process and uh, methods for proceeding. With that said, I'll open it up uh, to comments and questions from members of the ESC. Doug. Hi, this is, this, this is Yeah, Lynn. I just had, uh, oh, go ahead, Lynn. Oh, Doug, do you want to go ahead? No, you go. You go first. I'll go after you. <laughs> okay. I can um, I can uh, mediate this for you if you'd like. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. You do a great job at that. Um, uh, I guess my question is two. There's there's two parts to it. The first part is if it is our role to provide you guidance. Um, there are a lot of decisions that have already been made um, in order to get a. ODOT contract and scope. So I feel, um, well, we, we, you know, we've all maybe had a little bit of, of discussion about this. It, it's not, um, not something that we had up front as a group um, to go over your scope, right? So I feel at a slightly at a disadvantage already. Um, so I guess my question is, how do we, how do we put the quote oversight of your independent study back in the right position, which is after you have a contract from the contracting body that you're supposed to be independent from, how do we put that empowerment back into the ESC? That's, that's the first part. Um, and then the second part is in maybe an attempt to uh, not just gain information with the one-on-ones, but also to provide the opportunity for you to continue to be independent um, I'm not looking for you guys to tell us how you how you want to do that necessarily. Although recommendations would be great, but I think it's depend. The ESC should really think about how how do we actually make sure that, and I'll put air quotes around protected, 
that you are protected in order to be able to carry on an independent assessment and not have backlash against you um, because it's, it's different than what had been anticipated prior. So, so I think, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I just, I, it's, I think it's, it, your, your input on both of those would be helpful, but I think the ESC needs to have some sort of, some sort of facilitated conversation with you to get to those answers, right? Right, and that was gonna be my suggestion that we work with Dr. Holt and Erica offline uh, to sit down and talk about this and, and work it out and to see to what extent, if any, the ESC as a body would find it helpful that our roles and responsibilities are laid out in your charter. There's many other um, options, I'm that's one. No, I'm looking for a little bit more participation in proactive, uh, something not not just uh, a sentence in a in a I'm looking for a um, a little bit more proactive governance on this so that that we are assured that you are assured that you have the protections you need to be independent perfect Doug I think you're up next yeah no actually thanks Lynn uh, this kind of gets a bit to the question I was going to ask uh, is really around the governance of the independence. Um, so I, I do, I, 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 other, I need to understand what that looks like personally a bit more, particularly as it connects to the ESC or to OTC, whichever, where it's going to go. Um, I think it's the, what you said is it's at ESC, it does not relate to OSC. Within that though, I do have a question around your or your team reporting any relationships of influence or conflict. I've been around other independent assessment uh, uh, mechanisms before, and that governance oversight I think is is really important, including you know a community such as this is relatively small, frankly, and uh, you know through prior clients, through other work that you may or may not have done, I don't know your background, so I apologize in advance. I really want to make sure that uh, as a declaration of independence, it really is 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 intended to be protected. To everybody's advantage, so the governance oversight pieces of uh, is uh, important in, in interest for me. Thank you. I'll certainly look into that as well and report back. Any other members of the ESC like to comment, question, suggest? I guess I want to. This is Nate McCoy, NAMAC, Oregon. Uh, I want to dovetail on kind of what Doug and Lynn both said, and 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 I think. I, I air my my comment more on the community side. Um, I think we all know too well that community does not always trust government, and uh, like so, I would say consultants. And you know, I only know Nolan on this call, but uh, there are many on it that I just wonder what mechanisms would we have in place for people to actually trust and value the conversations you guys might set and do it in a way where you actually get real information and. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking about what Lynn's comments are, is, is there a way for ESC to be embodied in some of these community conversations in the way that we're actually talking to community that may trust us a little bit more? I mean, I wouldn't want to sugarcoat it as if, you know, uh, NAMAC is working with everybody in the community, but I'm just wondering how do we build that, that trust factor, that meaningfulness and I go back to data, which seems to be the missing component in this conversation, back to goals versus outcomes and what's really going to happen. I just wonder, how is this team and, you know, Nolan, Sam, you know, whoever, how are we going to ensure communities? Because I'm not, I didn't sign up with ESC to rubber stamp uh, anything that looks like uh, meaningless community engagement. And so just wondering what nuances are coming into play that makes community feel like uh, we're getting to the things that look like uh, we're going to impact uh, the future as we move forward. Nolan. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Nate. I appreciate you um, noting that. Um, and I think there's sort of two answers um, to this whole package of question. Um, one is that at the end of this, um, we'll write memos and those memos will be public. Um, but the recommendation back to the OTC will come from this committee. And so if we have not made all of you feel that we have had a meaningful and authentic conversation with the community, you're not gonna 
promote what we create. It won't have value. And so our job is to be connecting with you closely and, and really frequently so that we get to the end zone and we actually have something of value that you think is of value. Um, if we don't and you say, you know, my friends, family and constituents don't feel that you have had an authentic uh, engagement and that the product doesn't represent the true aspirations of the community, we will not have done our job. So that's that's the first. And and we will rely on on all of you to be checking in with us every time we see you about whether we've done that and, and hold us accountable to that. Uh, the second thing I would note, which which. Uh, in order of our process comes first, is that um, our intent was and is um, really to check in with many of you who have those deep community connections and get recommendations about who we should speak to and how we should speak to them. And so um, your question is perfect. Uh, we haven't had all those one-on-one -on -one conversations with you yet, but we will. Um, and I think you received an email to that effect last week. Um, and so uh, we already know that our process of outreach is incomplete because we haven't yet had those conversations with you, but I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, Dr. Hold, I'm, I'm cautious of the time, so I, I'll, I'll ask you if I ask for one, any last call or would you like to take over for the rest of your meeting? Thanks, Sam. I appreciate it. I think we will take it. I'll take it from here. And let me encourage um, that the ESC members will have the opportunity for the one-on-ones and you can dive deeply into all of the conversation you need to have and then we'll filter out the uh, responses and report back to the ESC as we're going forward. As you can tell, this is a robust, um, uh, this is quite a bit of, of energy and robust conversations are going to be naturally a part of it. So I have an ask around our next steps as we're wrapping it up. I have an ask for you to consider. You don't have to determine right now. But uh, I would ask us to, as uh, Chair Simpson indicated, we live by our calendar. Many of us do. We're driven by the calendar. My ask would be to consider extending our time from a 90-minute meeting to a two-hour meeting with this provision and caveat that provided we don't need it, you'll get time back into your day. But I would hate to be in a space where we're not being able to finish necessary conversation, that we're not being able to bring to the table the kind of equitable work that we're representing and so that we can think through, talk through, wrestle with, process what needs to be done so that we don't misstep or missteps at this critical kind of juncture. This is the space. This is the opportunity for us to do something significantly different. And my ask would be that we consider more time uh, to make sure we do that than less. A 90 minute um, meeting. So, Dr. Hoda, I, I, I think you're onto something, but I would personally push back a little bit on that one because yeah. I think that the fact that we were reconvening today, we probably ate about 35, 40 minutes off the clock on just intros and backdrops. So I think now that we have those big clunky things kind of out the way, I don't think we probably need to do like intros every single meeting. Um, but um, if we have obviously agenda items. I know, and then obviously this was a big agenda item. So absolutely, um, I, think, I think the key here is just ensuring that we concisely get the agenda items out beforehand and we get through intros and kind of the, the you know, obviously we got to, we got to dot some E, uh, dot some I's across some T's on the values and, and the other elements that you presented earlier. But I think we shoot one more time at 90 minutes and then we see how that, how we manage that clock. And then if we need to expand on that, then we go ahead and pivot based on, you know, everybody's availability. But I wouldn't want to just immediately just jump onto two hours like that. Cause I know that that's, that, that's, that's a lot of time for folks. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Doug I, from TriMet. I, I sub, very much support Orlando's comment. I think we're doing some storming, norming, forming at the front end. Mm -hmm. And that naturally takes some time. But I think if we, um, continued the rigor um, in uh, meeting management, I, I would suggest staying with 90 minutes um, and uh, uh, manage accordingly. I'd rather have more meetings. Not, I'm not looking for more meetings, trust me, but then adding on, because also after two hours, um, I think we, you start to wear out what you really, we really got to say. So um, I would stay, I encourage us to stay rigorous to the 90. Appreciate that. Thank you. 
And I so we I, think we obviously, I think next meeting will be a, a big testament to how we monitor our, our clock, but then also whether or not we want to pursue with a little bit more cushion on our allocated time for these meetings. And I'll open that up if anybody else wants to thumb up or thumb down that, but that's just my personal observation on this. Well, thank you both for weighing in. I appreciate it. So then my next ask would be that we make sure that we connect around our one-on-ones because we can reduce quite a bit in our one-on-ones prior to our coming together. And it helps me if we can talk through the issues thoroughly uh, so that we don't have to then rehash them in a way that takes away some of our time. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I support that. Great, great comment. Thank you very much. All right, our next steps then is, uh, I think everyone has on your calendar, and hopefully you do for the rest of the year, and we're planning on the fourth Monday uh, from this time, from 3 to 4.30 in our meetings going forward. So, And you will be getting um, calendar invites. You will always get the information of the meeting and the, the Zoom login the day of uh, as a reminder. That way you don't have to search for it in your emails. Um, so you can anticipate that. Um, is there anything else within the next step that I did not cover? Erica, is there anything that I'm missing? No, I think you hit everything. Uh, just be looking for your calendar invite to con contain your individual panelist links. And um, uh, we apologize for inundating you with emails. Uh, we're just trying to get all the information to you so that you can be uh, prepared to engage uh, thoughtfully and thoroughly uh, on these very uh, uh, important, important subjects. So thank you. Thanks for your time, everyone. I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate your work and your investment. Let's do something great together. Have a good evening. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Hope. My pleasure. Good night, Thanks. everyone. Thank you.